This episode was made possible by CuriosityStream. Hello, welcome to Up and Atom. I'm Jade and I have a thought experiment for you. Imagine you have an infinitely large vase and an infinite number of balls, all labelled 1, 2, 3 and so on. So obviously this is not an infinitely large vase and this is not an infinite number of balls, I'm on a budget, but this is a thought experiment and we can do things here that we can't usually do in the real world. The time is exactly one minute before noon. You add balls one to 10 and remove ball 10. At exactly half a minute until noon, you add balls 11 to 20 and remove ball 20. At one quarter of a minute until noon, you add balls 21 to 30 and remove ball 30. You keep going in this fashion, adding more balls and removing one at each time division until you reach noon. Now the question is, how many balls are in the vase at noon? If you'd like to think about this yourself first, pause the video now and write your answer in the comments. So if I were to try and answer this question, I'd probably go something like this. For every 10 balls you put in, you're only taking one ball out. All you're really doing is putting in 9 balls at every step, right? So at noon, we can agree that there will definitely be some number of balls in the vase. But how many? Well, how many times do you put balls in? If we figure out the number of times you put the balls in, or time steps, we'll call them, we can just multiply that by 9 and that should tell us how many balls there are. Seems simple enough. The pattern is that each time step takes place in half the amount of time as the last. At 60 seconds, then 30 seconds, then at 15 seconds, and so on. If we treat time as infinitely divisible, then there's always enough time for the next step. Whatever amount of seconds we end up with, we can always just divide it in half again. Therefore, there are an infinite number of time steps. Infinity times 9 is infinity, so there should be infinitely many balls left in the vase at noon. Um, my vase is empty. What? Yeah, it, it's empty. Maybe I did it wrong? Yeah, probably. I thought you said to remove ball 1 at the first time step, and ball 2 at the second time step, and ball 3 at the third time step, and so on. Well, that shouldn't change anything because we're still putting in nine balls for every one we're taking out. Yeah, but if at the first time step we take out ball one, and the second time step we take out ball two, and the third time step we take out ball three, and the billionth time step we take out ball one billion, then if there are an infinite number of time steps, we take out an infinite number of balls. What about ball three million four hundred and thirty-six? Is that still in there? Well, no, that was taken out on the three millionth four hundred and thirty-sixth step. Seriously, for every ball, there was a time step where I took it out. The vase is empty. This is called the Ross Littlewood Paradox. We have two arguments that each seem reasonable, but that come to two completely different conclusions. How? Let's dive in. Have we messed up somewhere in our counting? Come to think of it, what really is counting? Let's say you've totally forgotten how to count. It's just one of those days. You're also surrounded by a bunch of cows. Again, one of those days. Now each cow wants a milkshake and you need to know whether to make more. So how would you go about doing this? Well, you can simply give the milkshakes out one milkshake per cow. If there are cows without a milkshake, then there were more cows than milkshakes. If there are extra milkshakes, there were more milkshakes than cows. If we run out of cows and milkshakes at the same time, then every cow has exactly one milkshake and every milkshake belongs to exactly one cow. And the set of cows was the same size as the set of milkshakes. This is called a one-to-one -one correspondence and can be thought of as a way to count without actually counting. If we can place the elements of a set in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the elements of another set, the two sets are the same size. That is, they have the same number of elements in them. This is a pretty straightforward idea, but the thing is, there were a finite amount of cows and milkshakes. Will it help us with our problem where we have an infinite amount of objects? Well, let's see. Let's test it out on two infinite sets of numbers. 
Let's take the set of all the counting numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and so on, and the set of counting numbers without the first 100 elements. So it starts at 101, then 102, 103, 104, and so on. We'll call the set of all counting numbers x, and the set of all counting numbers minus the first 100 elements y. So if I'd heard this for the first time, I'd think, well, y is definitely smaller than x. After all, the two sets have all the same things in them, except that y is missing the 100 smallest elements of x. So y should be smaller, right? Well, let's try our one-to-one -one correspondence idea to see. Take the element 1 from x and pair it with 101 from y. Match 2 from x with 102 from y, 3 from x with 103 from y. It looks like every element in x gets paired with an element from y. Now because we know that the counting numbers go on forever, we're never going to run out of elements from either set. Because of the pairing we're using, we won't skip any either. We can even say exactly which element of x is paired with a given element of y and vice versa. For example, element 109,732 from x is paired with element 109,832 from y. Because every element from each set is paired with exactly one element from the other set, this is a one-to-one -one correspondence and the two sets have the same size. That's a little bit surprising, but does it help us solve our paradox? In the Rust Littlewood paradox with the balls in the vase, we aren't just putting in 100 extra balls, we're putting in 9 balls for every ball we're taking out. So it seems like there should be 9 times as many more balls in the vase than we took out. What could be an example that deals with something more like that? How about this time we compare the infinite set of counting numbers x with the infinite set of even counting numbers, we'll call it e. We can tell just by looking that e has half as many elements as x, right? Well, let's see what happens if we try a one-to-one -one correspondence. Let's try matching 2 in x with 2 in e, then 4 in x with 4 in e, 6 in x with 6 in e, and so on. This pairing doesn't seem to work. We're missing all the odd numbers in x, which isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence. So does that mean the sets aren't the same size? x really is twice as big as e. Well, before we jump to any conclusions, let's try another pairing. What if instead we match 1 from x with 2 from e, then match 2 from x with 4 from e, then 3 from x with 6 from e, and so on. With this pattern, we never run out of elements from either set, and every element from y is paired with exactly one element from e, and vice versa. This is a one-to-one -one correspondence. This means that the two sets are, in fact, the same size. So with the wrong pairing, it looked like x had twice as many elements as e, but by finding the right pairing, we managed to show that they are, in fact, the same size. The same logic works for a set that looks like it has nine times as many elements as another. We can always find a one-to-one -one correspondence. So what does this mean for our paradox? How many balls are in the vase at noon? Who was right? Me or Blade? Well, the answer is... We were both right. By choosing to take out balls 1, 2, 3 and so on, Blade managed to create a one-to-one -one correspondence between the number of balls taken out and the number of time steps. That means all the balls were taken out, so at noon we're left with zero balls. I, however, failed to create a one-to-one -one correspondence. By taking out balls 10, 20, 30 and so on, the remaining balls never had a chance to be mapped to a specific time step and so were never taken out. So at noon, we're left with an infinite number of balls. In fact, depending on which balls you decide to remove, any chosen number of balls can be left in the vase at noon. Can you see why? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. This actually isn't a real paradox, there is no logical inconsistency. The way infinity behaves just goes against our intuition about numbers. Both explanations are perfectly reasonable. Basic rules of arithmetic like subtraction and multiplication are different for infinity.
I find this really interesting because these concepts seem fundamental to our reality and the way we experience the world. Earlier in the video I said that 9 times infinity is infinity, but that reasoning doesn't work because we're trying to apply the usual laws of arithmetic, which are defined for numbers, not for infinity. Isn't it weird that such fundamental ideas don't apply to everything the same way? Why not? What makes infinity different from the usual objects we deal with in everyday life? The idea of infinity seems so natural to us. From the time we learn to count, the next question is, well, what would happen if I counted forever? How can there be a biggest number when I can always add one more? But even everyday symbols evoke feelings of endlessness. For example, the sign of infinity, which is called a lemnus gate, perfectly resembles the idea it represents as one can trace it forever without end. The idea of something going on forever and ever fascinates and mesmerizes us. Infinity seems like a straightforward continuation of the basic idea of counting. So then, why doesn't it behave the same way? Is it just some purely abstract entity with different rules than mathematics based in the real world? Well, infinity may not be so separate from the real world. The very idea of forever is based on one of the most fundamental concepts in physics, time. Many cosmologists believe that our universe will one day stop expanding and eventually fall in on itself, but some believe that it will simply keep expanding forever. But even if the universe did end, would time end? Did time exist before the Big Bang? It's not so straightforward to dismiss the idea of infinity in a description of time. Mathematics, and therefore physics, would be extremely limited without the concept of infinity. Even if this is just a mind tool we've created to help us understand our world, it's interesting that it works so well given that infinity seems to obey different rules. But back to the question of why the infinite and finite behave differently in the first place. Where are the boundaries between the physical world and the mathematical world, and the way we experience the world? I don't bring up these questions to be mystical or deep. I just want to point out that the nature of reality is more complicated and fascinating than we might think. Infinity is right on the threshold of one of the most interesting questions in philosophy. Is math invented or discovered? Would the concept of infinity exist if us humans weren't there to conceive of it? Did we invent it to solve problems, or was it always there and we just discovered it? This question fascinated me so much that I made a feature video about it on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform made by a bunch of us educational YouTube creators where we can explore making different and experimental content. Oh, and it's now been nominated for a Streamy Award, which is pretty cool. CuriosityStream, a streaming service with award-winning documentaries, is so supportive of our new venture that they're offering Nebula completely free when you sign up with them. In fact, there's a really cool documentary by Hannah Fry about this exact question of whether math is an invention or a discovery. It's full of trippy visuals and loads of mathematical ideas, but presented in a very easy to understand way. I watched the entire three hour series in one go, so if you do get the two for one deal, make sure to watch Hannah Fry's Magic Numbers and also my video on Nebula, cause I think it's pretty good. Sign up with the link in the description or go to curiositystream.com slash up and Adam. That's it from me and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.